What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I'm very excited to be joined once again by the one and only Peter Bukowski. You can find him on Locked On Packers, on The Leap, on just about everything else you want to find him on. Peter, great to be chatting with you again. Thanks so much for joining me. How the heck are you doing? I am uh, recovering from the calorie coma of last week. Um, I, if you if you need me, you will find me on the Peloton uh, or eating a salad uh, at least until Christmas. None uh, of that so, is true. Did you have a Thanksgiving pizza? That's the big question. You know, I didn't. I didn't have a Thanksgiving pizza, but um, I have had pizza multiple times in the last week. So we're we're like moderately on the same wavelength. All right, deal. We'll we'll stick to that because that's not always the case usually. So we'll start on a good that's note. Right. I figure what we could do today, you know, obviously it's the bye week. There's not a ton going on, but Brian Gutekunst has had an incredibly interesting year from beginning until now, from basically end of NFC championship game last year until now. There's been a ton of activity, maybe not in the traditional sense of, you know, signing a ton of free agents. It wasn't like a Amos, Sedarius, Preston, Billy Turner sort of off season, but from Aaron Rodgers drama to Razul Douglas and everything else in the middle, it really has been sort of crazy. So I figure what we could do is go position by position and just kind of recap everything that's happened and everything that Brian Gutekinds has done, because I think it's a fairly impressive year that he's been having. So let's start how appropriately at quarterback. Now, in theory, nothing really has changed at quarterback. Yes, Tim Boyle, unfortunately, is with the Detroit Lions. Kirk Benkert is on the practice squad. We'll save that conversation for another day. But the big thing all offseason was the entire Aaron Rodgers drama. And up until, you know, up into maybe wanting maybe potentially Brian Gutekinds out of a job like that is not an easy situation to navigate in any way, shape or form. And I really do believe that Brian Gutekinds navigated that about as well as possible. I want to hear your thoughts on that. And then we'll kind of get into, you know, just everything else. So what's, what I think is, is important on this and you use the word interesting to describe uh, Brian Gutekinds off season. I don't know if that's the word Aaron Rodgers would use, <laughs> but um the, the thing about the off season is um, we can't, we can't judge the off season based only on what happened in the off season. We have to take it in totality. And this has been building for a while. Um, I, I did a long, a long piece for acting packing company on the timeline of this. And you go back, I mean, it is years. We're talking James Jones, um, you know, almost 10 years ago now that, that there was, whatever promises made or, or Rogers felt like they were going to make efforts to sign players that they ended up not signing. And, and so this, this goes back a ways. The, the Packers made a very important decision when they said, we're going to draft Jordan love irrespective of the context. They did not handle that well at all. Agreed. And that sets up everything that happens because Aaron Rodgers, I, I understand. And I, 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 I don't know what the, the right phrasing on this is. I, <laughs> I believe him when he says, this is not about Jordan love the person, but it is about Jordan love, the draft pick and that move, that decision, because that set in motion, everything with Aaron Rodgers, and everything goes back to that thing. I don't have a problem with, the pick, but I do have a problem with the way they handled the pick. Now, do I think Aaron Rodgers would still be hella pissed if they had called him ahead of time and said, Hey, we might be taking Jordan love. Yeah. That's the thing is there. I don't know that there was, I don't know if handling it better, quote unquote, changes the ultimate outcome of Aaron Rodgers being so pissed. He's ready to walk away. I just, I think, I think the die is cast no matter what, uh, as long as Jordan love is the quarterback. I don't as long as he's the pick. You. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. And I think it does go back to that. But now in, in hindsight, knowing what we know now, I, I don't think every bridge is mended. I don't think every, you know, I don't think they've fixed everything by any way, shape or form. But I do think, you know, the, the way that they were able to ultimately navigate that, because I guarantee you there's some GMs that would have said, you want out, fine, you're out. We're going to, we're going to go in a different direction. And he didn't do that. And it, I'll be fully transparent. If I was in that position and I got word that potentially the quarterback wanted me out of a job, 
the, my first reaction is going to be, well, we're going to have to move on from that quarterback. And, you know, now maybe he didn't have the ability to do that. Maybe Mark Murphy or, uh, you know, literally everyone else in the organization <laughs> overrode him. Who knows? Uh, we, we, we're certainly not privy to that information. But I do feel like for the most part since that, and, and he's admitted to wishing that they would have communicated things better and handled that differently and so on and so forth. The fact that they made the trips to to Aaron to try to sort of mend those fences to, um, you know, to get him ultimately back in Green Bay, to see them from time to time chatting on the sidelines, to acquiring Randall Cobb to make that work. I, I don't know that you can like give credit because, you know, you if, if the person makes the mess in the first place, I don't know that like mopping it up, like gets you a ton of credit. In, but I still feel like overall where Green Bay is at right now, I don't know. I don't know. I can't like give it a, uh, like a positive. I can't spin it necessarily in a positive way, but uh, in some ways I do appreciate the way that it's been handled this season. Yeah. If someone decides to have pizza on Thanksgiving and then eats all the pizza, you don't get credit for eating all the pizza when you decided to have pizza on Thanksgiving. I, I think it's that kind of situation. So from that standpoint, um, I, I, I get what, what your perspective is on that. It is interesting, isn't it? That once Brian Gutekind can set on the record, I wish we'd handled it differently. I wish I'd communicated it differently. It wasn't that long after that Aaron Rodgers tone started to soften toward the organization. And we don't know what was going on behind the scenes, what conversations were being had. Who knows if they were saying, you know, look, we're, you know, we, we have, have these ideas for these players, mid season trades, and, and maybe they're planting the seeds for, Hey, Stefan Gilmore, he's, He's available. We know he's available. By the way, everyone knew he was going to be available. Like that, those conversations could have been happening behind the scenes. It could have been as simple as he he wanted the team to say we screwed up and we we handled this poorly. And sometimes, by the way, I said this on my show. Sometimes all you want is for the person you're arguing with to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. You don't, you don't need to give me some long explanation. I don't need to hear, you know, that, that you had to go over the river and through the woods to get to grandma's house. I just need you to say, I'm sorry, I screwed up and we'll move forward. I'll uh, like, uh, that's fine. Do I think that is what happened? No, but is that, is that a reasonable thing for a reasonable person to, to, to be in a situation with? Yes. And I think what Aaron Rodgers cares most about is the team making moves that makes the team better. And I think everything else that that the team did in the interim signals to Rodgers, this is a competent organization that does care about winning. And more than that, is actually very good at putting together a roster that that breeds winning. And, and the cool thing is we get to talk about that now. Yeah, I think we do. So let's, we could talk about that individual topic for, for literally ever and, and go on and on, but uh, that's going to be a full conversation for a ton of different days. Let's move on to running back. Cause in, you know, some interesting moves here, obviously the Aaron Jones contract, the big one here, I still think that's an interesting one to discuss one way or the other. I don't think there's any debating that this team is better with Aaron Jones on the roster. I think drafting Kylan Hill in the seventh round, unfortunately he got injured, but that looked like a, you know, a potential real sleeper steal of a pick in the seventh round. And I think moving on from Jamal Williams, Certainly seemed like the right move at the right time, paying another running back money uh, when you've already signed Jones and, you know, you know, obviously have a second round pick in Dylan didn't seem like the, the most logical thing to do. So I feel like this was a, a pretty nice offseason at the running back position. Let me ask you this. How different do you think the offense looks this year with Antonio Gibson and Jamal Williams at running back? I don't think it looks different at all. So that is a, a sizable difference in, in resource allocation, right? You're not paying Aaron Jones the big deal. You're paying Jamal the small deal. And you're, you're getting uh, two running backs that, that you feel like are, are solid contributors to your team. Now, I don't think, I, I, like, I think Aaron Jones is better than any player on, in either of those scenarios. And I actually think A.J. Dillon is probably better than, than Jamal Williams. And yet, I think you're right. Like, I think... Like Antonio Gibson plus Jamal Williams plus money plus like $10 million is probably the better situation to be in. For sure. Maybe you can trade for Stefan Gilmore. Maybe you can trade for Odell Beckham Jr. That being said, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this part of it. 
Um, this is something that that um, Jake Morley and, and Jake Westendorf and I have been talking about in the group chat since it happened. AJ Dillon, that that pick, because that's what I'm talking about, right? Is is this this running back d- decision? The the AJ Dillon pick was made with the understanding that they want to keep Aaron Jones and they want to move on from Jamal Williams, and that makes sense. I remember you you had a tweet where you're like, yeah, there's there's probably a good chance that the the Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon, the Packers see that as the ultimate compliment to one another. I think that's probably true. Um, But you, you have this question about running back value. If you're going to take a running back is, is that the the right move in the second round? And if you're going to take a running back, doesn't he have to contribute in more ways? Now, what we got was an AJ Dillon that is, is contributing in way more ways than, than a lot of people thought that he could. Right. And, and that makes a big difference. I just, I, I happen to have been much personally higher on Antonio Gibson. I think he would be phenomenal in this offense. I think he would, he could be a lot of the things that Aaron Jones gives you. And then to have Jamal Williams, that being said, AJ Dillon is a really, really, really good football player. And what you want in a draft is to get really good football players. And even if the positional value is not ideal, and you have these other players that that maybe I was higher on. AJ Dillon is really freaking good. He's a fan favorite already. He's a great guy. He's great for your locker room. It is hard for me to fault the Packers for seeing that guy and going, we want to keep Aaron Jones as a core piece of our team. This is the perfect guy. And he is the perfect guy to pair with him. So let's get that guy. That thought process, I, that's I think that's pretty good process to me. No, I agree. And this, this is always a, like, I, I think I also tweeted last year of like, my soul was literally split in two because I a million percent want Aaron Jones on this football team. He's also a fan favorite. Great for the locker room. I mean, just like who doesn't want Aaron Jones in some capacity on this football team. I am also a million percent in the don't pay running backs and don't spend second round draft picks on running backs camp. And sometimes it's just, you know, those are difficult decisions to make. And as you know, I think you're stating, I'm stating this team is certainly better with Jones and Dylan on the roster. I would even go as far to say, you know, you asked the question about like Gibson and um, Jamal Williams. I would even go as far to say is I don't know that this offense looks appreciatively different, even if and they, they wouldn't have known this at the time, of course, but if it was just uh, Dylan and Kylan Hill, like right. I think if, if, if Hill was healthy and of course, again, you don't, you're not expecting a seventh round pick to look the way he did in, in camp and preseason and stuff. But I think those two could have even been uh, good enough. And then uh, you could also get into the question of like, would you rather have Aaron Jones and uh, Kevin King or Corey Lindsley? Because I could make a very strong argument right now. And then a second round pick that you didn't maybe need to spend on my, like we could go down a million rabbit holes with this, but right. at the end of the day, good players that they found. I think you tweeted it. You just said it now. <laughs> One of the best things you can do as a GM is get good players on your roster. Jones, good player. Kylan Hill, good player. AJ Dillon, good player. I think Brian Gudekins ultimately deserves credit. Even if we could debate best use of picks, capital, et cetera, over and over. Let's jump to wide receiver. I don't know how much we can give uh, Randall Cobb to Brian Gutekunst, but it did certainly uh, give a little bit of an olive branch to get Rodgers back. And it's certainly been helpful to the team. I think Amari Rodgers has been a little bit of a disappointment. Rookie wide receivers generally take a little bit more to get going. The only other real wide receiver here is is not getting Odell Beckham. I don't know how much we want to even go into that, but I think those are really the three moves at wide receiver throughout the course of this season or lack thereof. And and I think the thing about the receiver position for me is Brian Gutekinds made his moves at receiver. And the impact that we see week in and week out from Marquez Valdez Scantling in and out, in the lineup and out of it. I mean, the Packers, we talk about this two shell coverage stuff. They don't see as much two shell as a team like the Bills or the Chiefs because they don't have the same vertical speed threats consistently as the Bills and the Chiefs because Devontae Adams, who is the best receiver in football, is not Tyree Kill. That's not Devontae Slander. He just doesn't run for two. And he it's just not what they do. So getting someone like MBS when he got him to get him as a day three pick, Equinemia St. Brown. If all he ever did was contribute this season the way that he is, he'd be worth the pick that they got to get him. For sure. And Alan Lazard, a revelation 
plucking him off a of practice squad. Brian Gutekinds has a habit of plucking guys off practice squads of believing our scouting staff is smarter than your coaching staff, right? Because it's the coaching staff going, and we don't we don't have a place for Alan Lazard. Like imagine if Alan Lazard had just stayed in Jacksonville, he I'm might the be their wide receiver the one, right? That's Sorry. completely devoid of talent. Right. He could be wide receiver one on that team. And it would actually be a, pre a pretty fun offense with Lazard, Marvin Jones, and LaVisca Chenault. That's kind of a fun receiver room. Yeah. What, what he is able to do as a blocker is essential to this offense and the flexibility that they have. So I, I really I really like the room that they put together. Um, I've, I've been saying that you, you don't necessarily need Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson if you have guys who have elite skills. As Napoleon Dynamite once said, chicks love guys with great skills. And offenses love guys with great skills. MBS has an elite skill, one elite skill. It's a really important skill. Alan Lazard has one elite skill. It's a really important skill in this, in this offense. offense. Yeah. And it is interesting, isn't it? Uh, how this offense has changed with Randall Cobb though. And you and I, a couple of weeks ago it. had a, had a conversation about his impact and what it could be. I was also I, like, I can't take a victory lap on it because I said for a year and a half before they got Randall Cobb, this team doesn't need a real slot receiver. And it turns out this team with a real slot receiver is frightening. And when, when Randall Cobb is involved, this team is, I mean, if, if he plays in the second half, they score 40 against the Rams. Like it's nothing. Yeah. And so you're right. We don't get to give Brian Goodikens credit for Randall Cobb, but they did draft Amari Rogers in search of a Randall Cobb type. And so whether that was input from Rogers only, we don't know. You have to assume that Matt LaFleur, Luke Getze, um, that these guys had some input in, in some of these, these players. They're really excited about Amari Rogers. Um, he just hasn't produced. So I, I give, I give Brian Gutekinds some credit on the Randall Cobb thing, because I think he saw what Rogers was saying. Sometimes it's important for you to take that input, right. And say, okay, well then this is the best guy in the draft. That is the, the sort of closest comp and see what he can do. So, I mean, I, like I said, it's more than just what he did at receiver this off season, because he created with the exception of Devonte Adams, which that's a big exception. He created the rest of yeah. this pass catcher room. And, and I, I think they're, a really diverse group. And it's crazy how much sense the Cobb thing makes in hindsight, because we know how much Rogers values just consistency and trust. And he has now two guys that he trusts unequivocally in Cobb and Adams. And you can just see like he, he will give them balls that he doesn't give to anyone else because he just trusts them. That means so much for Rogers. And that means so much for this offense. It really was, I think one of the more um, underrated moves of the offseason, whether it was Rodgers or Gutekunst or anything in between, it has helped this offense a lot. Let's go to tight end. Nothing really major to discuss here. They move on from Sternberger, which I think was the right move. Uh, obviously, hasn't done anything anywhere else. Um, Mercedes Lewis, they bring back, obviously, the right move. I think even Robert Tunyon not quite going all in and giving them the big contract. We can say the injury and stuff like that, but even pre injury, didn't wasn't quite living up to what he was doing a season ago. I think this was a pretty, you know, uh, pretty wise off season at the tight end position. Yeah. And you know, uh, there, there is this idea that I had coming into the Matt LaFleur experience. And that was that this offense is, is designed for tight ends to just be open. You don't need someone who's going to get open and big Bob's best trait is that he is a fluid athlete with awesome hands. He catches everything in his area. That's all you need the guy to do is be in the right spot and catch the ball when, when Rogers throws it to you. The problem for Josiah DeGuara is not always in the right spot. And the problem with Mercedes Lewis is he is not going to ever be, again, um, someone who can stretch the seam. And so it's hard to create opportunities for him. Um, I, I sort of like the idea of the receiver screens to him in a vacuum. And then every time they throw him, I go, what are we doing here? And then every third time he breaks three tackles and picks up 20 yards and you're just like, yes, big dog. There he is. And, and so it's like, it's, it's one of those things. I understand why they keep doing it. And yet I'm, I'm kind of going like, okay, it's, I think it's time to, for Josiah DeGuara to get those opportunities because that's the guy you want catching the ball in space and trying to go make a thing happen because he's just so much more athletic. 
it is a position that I think was disappointing. You're right. Um, uh, Tunyon was not performing at, at a high level, although he was just starting to catch fire right before sure. he got hurt. Um, and so, you know, well, it'll be interesting to see. I, I think actually, um, well, actually, Andy, um, I, I think it is to Brian Gutekind's credit that he didn't that he didn't sign Big Bob Tunyon. Agreed. That he waited to see because it's really just one season, right? He had the breakout year and what eight of his touchdowns were, were schemed up goal line wide open. Um, you know, it's, it's boot and he's, and he's, you know, no one around him in the end zone. It's they're schemed up scores. He had the nice one against Deion Jones. You know, I think he had a second reaction touchdown and then there was a, a long one. Like eh, those, those are not, those are not all uh big Bob. Right. And so I think waiting is actually a mark in his favor because it, prove it. Let's see it again. And Tunyon was not on track to get the same kind of deal he would have gotten had he signed based on this one season of productivity. No, 100% agreed. And I think that does go as a mark in the cap of Gutekunst of just kind of playing it a little bit safe, seeing if he could do it again and then figuring things out later. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Tunyon this offseason. Let's move to offensive line. Interesting offseason here as well. Corey Lindsley gone. He's having a great year with the chargers, uh, mm-hmm. you know, as expected 30 year off, you know, 30 year old third contract offensive linemen are always risky and it's just one season. And he would have had to sign him obviously to a multi-year deal. So there's a lot of layers to that getting Josh Myers in the second round certainly seems like a good pick did have Creed Humphrey on the board, but uh, nonetheless, Myers is pretty solid before the injury Royce Newman. I know he has struggled, but as a fourth round rookie, I'm not sure what more you can ask of in that situation. Also signed Dennis Kelly, bottom of the, the roster. I just like having a veteran in that spot. So you don't have to trust in, you know, I know Yash is an undrafted guy who is obviously in his third year, but it's not like you've got to put in an Alex Light or something like that where you're just, you know, you have to Tom change Barclay. your offense entirely. So even though we haven't seen Dennis Kelly, I like the move in theory. I, li- I liked that move a lot, a lot more in theory until we saw Dennis Kelly play. Um, and then it's just like, oh, was was last year? Did I was was I like taking sleeping pills last year watching that guy play because he didn't look anything like? And maybe it just turned out that he was hurt. I mean, right. it, it, that seems more plausible to me. But he's also still like not around, and they're they're putting in Yash Nijman out there instead of Dennis Kelly, who started for the Titans last year. So I do think that speaks to to where they are with him. I I, I just. The, the Lindsley thing is tough because of how good he's been. Yeah. That said, I was totally on board with, Hey, someone, someone pay him all the money. He deserves it. He's a great guy, great family. They're, they're terrific for the community and they got to LA and within five minutes, they're doing great things for Southern California communities. Um, his wife is, is hugely involved. And, and again, there are, there are credit to any organization that they're a part of. You just wish you could pay everyone. And the reality is you can't. The Packers also don't give, as you, as you mentioned, third contracts to basically anyone. The list is, is essentially David Bakhtiari, Chad Clifton, and, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe they bring Mark Tauscher out of retirement. Um, you know, it's one of those things. So it's, it's I think, a predictable way that they handled it. Um, Josh Myers, as you said, was having a, a pretty good rookie season. If you look at the win rate numbers, you mentioned Creed Humphrey, though. They could have had Creed Humphrey. He was a freak athlete. He seemed like an intuitive fit in Green Bay. I think it was actually a, a bit of a shock. They took a non-Creed Humphrey center in that spot. And guess what? Josh Myers had injury issues at Ohio State. Yeah, He has injury issues now. Now, there is, there is some, some, I think, compelling data that says injury prone is not actually a thing. Um that there's, there really isn't a correlation to number of injuries early and number of injuries late. Um, I don't, I don't know that I believe that, but, um, it, it is unfortunate that that's the, the position that the Packers find themselves in. Also Royce Newman is going to be fine. Like, I think, I think Royce Newman is going to be a very good football player. Um, he needs to work on the mental side. This is a new game. This is a new position. It is a lot of new moving pieces for him. He's had moving pieces around him, different centers, um, and, and he, he played multiple positions in, in OTAs and, and in training camp. So I think he's going to be good if we judge it just based on now. I mean, how, how can you not with the way that this offensive line is played, 
and the work that Adam Stenovich has done not feel really good about this team's ability to constantly churn through the offensive line and play the, and play at a high level in these high leverage situations, they, they've done it consistently. So uh, it, it, I, what, what, what else is there to say? They did a really good job com- constructing a really good roster, a, a roster that is, has been able to withstand incredible, incredible injury upheaval. And for them to, to you know, dismantle the Rams the way that they did with a third string left tackle and a backup center. And I technically none of their preferred starters from center to left tackle. That is, that is crazy. That should not happen. No, it shouldn't. And I think the depth that they have overall, especially on the offensive line is commendable. And Brian Gutekinds deserves a ton of credit for their, for that. You've said that uh, very, very well. Let's jump to the defensive side of the ball. I'm going to group together defensive line and edge rusher. And I'll let you pick what you want to talk about here. Bringing back Dean Lowry. They could have got out of that contract. Um, They didn't, they brought him back. Uh, TJ Slayton, uh, obviously seems to be a very nice pick in the fifth round, get Jack Heflin as an undrafted free agent, bring back Lancaster on a relatively cheap, you know, team friendly deal, move on from Montrevious Adams, bring back Preston Smith and sort of redo his contract. Had had the opportunity to get out of that. I was vocal in thinking that they would and probably should. I will be vocal now and saying I was very much wrong. Uh, Whitney Merciless was a great signing for them. Just unfortunately got injured, uh, but it was a really nice midseason pickup. I think those are the main ones at, at edge and defensive line, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? I like the, the approach and the allocation of resources in this way. Um, they, they stocked the edge cabinet in 2019 and those dividends were paid out this year. And yeah. sometimes that happens and they were able to go out and get the veteran someone who was a low risk, high reward kind of player. Whitney Merciless was just starting to find his footing. I think they handled edge over the last two years, two and a half years as about as well as you can. I mean, Zadaria Smith has been the best free agent signing for the Packers since Charles Woodson. And I think one of the three best in Packers history, if we're, if we're like going back to Reggie White, Charles Woodson and Zadaria Smith, it seems like I don't even know who else is close. Yeah. Preston Smith has been a very good football player and Rashawn Gary is turning into a star before our eyes, a pick that I believe you tweeted. Are you serious? Or you've got to be kidding me or something like that. I mean, I had the same reaction. I was like, no way. And he's becoming a star. So I, I just don't know how you, you handle that any better. And then I kind of, once you have Kenny Clark under contract, I kind of don't care. Like I have, I was not like, draft Ross Blacklock. I'm, I'm always the, unless he is an ultra elite interior pass rusher, I just don't care. You can find TJ Slayton on day three. You can find Jack Heflin as a UDFA. You can find Dean Lowry on day three. You can find Tyler Lancaster on the street and you can build a defensive front. That is, is not just good enough. Ken Clark is really good. And so you just need some nice complimentary pieces. TJ Slayton is turning into a very solid rotational defensive lineman. Are they great against the run? No. Do I care that much? People know my, my position on this. No, I really don't. And so if you're going to rush the passer, that's, that's what matters to me. Um, And so I, I like, especially in retrospect, I like the way that they handled it. Did I, did I love them bringing back Dean Lowry? No, but he's been pretty solid. And did I love them bringing back Tyler Lancaster? No. I could, I could have done without Tyler Lancaster, but, but like they didn't pay him a lot of money. They paid him nothing yep. to come back and, and take Jack Heflin steps. Like, am I going to be mad about that? No, like that's fine. It's, it's some Kenny Clark insurance and and we're good. But the reason all of it works is Kenny Clark is an MFR. I mean, that guy is unbelievable. He's having an unbelievable season. He's got a better pressure rate than, than Aaron Donald. And uh, he's been, he's been a killer this year. That's, that's, what makes it work. And that's why, that's why it does work. So a plus for Brian Gutekinds for Kenny Clark. This, this <laughs> I defense mean, really is best. This defense is best when Kenny is at his best and he's been at his best for a good chunk of this season. All right, let's do inside linebacker and safety. I'll group those together so we can save kind of corner for the end. Obviously Devondre Campbell, massive, massive signing for green Bay. They get a Isaiah McDuffie in the draft. Meh. 
Uh, Christian Kirksey's gone, Kamal Martin gone. Both of those seem to be the right move. They experimented with Jalen Smith. I appreciated the fact that not only did they try it to see if it worked, but they abandoned ship as soon as they realized it didn't work. Safety, really nothing other than moving on from Raven Green, which he wasn't able to stay. As much as I liked Raven Green, he wasn't able to stay healthy in any of his three seasons. Goes to Tampa, what happens? He gets hurt. Um, So I think they made the right move there as well. Okay, so I think this is going to be the first time where I go, I'm puzzled. So the Devondre Campbell move, they, 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 you put them on a lie detector. There's no way they thought it was going to work out this well. They did not think he would be this good. He's been unbelievable. He's a pro bowler. There's no question. He's a pro bowler this season. They didn't, they didn't think he'd be this good, but they, they, by the way, he started from day one, they signed him and like they announced the signing and two hours later, he was, he was playing with the ones on that defense. So that tells you that they did like him, I think, probably more than the rest of the league who basically had let him, um, what did he get signed, August 6th? Yeah, right, right. Like, camp was on, and they brought in Devondre Campbell. So they, they got a little lucky with that, but but all credit to them. If they're going to play, and they knew they were going to play this much three safety, this big nickel look with Henry Black, they could not have thought or they, they should not have thought, maybe I'll say that, that the combination of Vernon Scott and Henry Black was going to be good enough to play 30, 40% of snaps. You see Henry Black getting toasted by Justin Jefferson on an angle route in the red zone, and you go, yeah, of course. A team is going to find that guy. No, I mean, and no team has a third safety who can run with Justin Jefferson, but that's the point is if, if that guy is a little better, you're not designing plays to attack that guy. And that's the difference. And so I was surprised that they did not, there are, there are, there are scrap heap safeties available every year, every year. There is a, a, a Devondre Campbell caliber player, old Devondre, not new Devondre out there to get that could give you that kind of, mm, maybe not upside. Like what, what Campbell is doing is, is crazy. But the Christian Kirksey version of the safety, the Trey Bostons, those guys are out there yeah. every year to be signed, and they just haven't done it. They could have they could have allocated some some draft resources at that position over the last two years. By the way, I thought they could have done it in 2019 or excuse me in 2020 as well. There were safeties I liked in the second and third rounds that they didn't that they didn't go after. I I. I think they would have benefited from doing something more there. And I say that as someone who liked Vernon Scott a decent amount, but that is, that is the thing that I think um, when we look back on this season, if they don't ultimately reach their goal, and I know we're now we're like really nitpicking third safety, <laughs> yeah. third safety, that that could be, you know, like Will Redmond in the NFC championship game dropped a gift interception. I think the play before the Kevin King, Scotty Miller touchdown. And if that play goes the other way, Maybe Green Bay wins. I mean, that this is the margin of winning or losing a Super Bowl. Is 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 your third safety terrible or is he fine? Is he passable? That can be the difference. And so I that is that is like the big uh, demerit for me with Brian Gutekind's offseason is not feeling like that is a more important position. I'm surprised Vernon Scott hasn't at least gotten a look. He just must not even be remotely close. Otherwise I would expect of, you know, maybe to to get at least a look at this point and just hasn't. Um, But I think it's a really good point. And I, I, um, you know, suggested, or at least put, put it out in the ether. I would almost like to see Razul Douglas in that role, potentially if you get Jair Alexander back, if you get Eric Stokes on the outside, Chandon's in the slot, Listen, Rizul Douglas is sick. He's actually taller and, and heavier than Henry Black is. I think he's actually a better tackler, or at least in the same realm. He's good in coverage. He's a great communicator. Um, I don't see why that couldn't at least work in theory, especially because when your sixth, you know, DB is on the field, they're passing anyway, more often than not. I don't know. I, w- I would love to see that. And maybe it's not ideal. Maybe there's reasons they're smarter than me. Uh, but I mean, that, that could be something that maybe works down the line when they get everyone back. What, what about Kevin King? What about Kevin King? <laughs> I mean, if they if they want to keep like I, I I could see so let me let me throw this at you and, and we can do this to transition to corner and then we'll set it, we'll set it up like that. Sure. What if they say we think the best three defensive back set we can put on the field is Eric Stokes, Russell Douglas, and Jair Alexander? I think by the way that is probably the case. 
if you if you feel good enough about Stokes and Russell Douglas on the outside, and I do, then you can put Jair Alexander in the slot, let him play star. Channon Sullivan, you know, God bless him. Maybe Channon becomes the third safety. I th- and by the way, he was awesome as the dime safety two years ago, and that was the that was the role that allowed him to earn more playing time as the nickel. Good point. I, I think they they have some flexibility there now. Do they want to do that midstream and make a change like that? That's tough. But when you have someone as special as Jair Alexander and you strike gold the way that they did with Russell Douglas and Eric Stokes, I mean, who would have thought if you'd have told me in March that the Packers would would have a a possibility that Eric Stokes and Russell Douglas would be making meaningful contributions, big time contributions to this team. I would have gone, Mm-mm, nope, yeah. there's no way that that's happening. And they've been, you know, I almost said unbelievable. It is, it is unbelievable to me that that is happening. They've not been unbelievable, but they've been really, really good as a group, especially playing above expectation. If that's, if that's the baseline is expectation. They have played way over expectation. And, and I, I could see at least wanting to think about giving that a shot. I talked myself out of Kevin King. Because you're right. What about Kevin King? Um, and I, I kind of now I'm obsessed with the idea of playing Channon as the as the fourth depend uh, that 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 dime safety because he's done it. We've seen him do it. Yeah. My only concern, and I mentioned this yesterday actually with Rachel. My only concern is can Jair play in the star in the slot if his shoulders banged up? Like, are they going to put him into harm's way? more tackles, more, you know, more going up against running backs in the slot. Are they going to I mean, do it's that? It's not like Shannon Sullivan is prime Charles Woodson in that regard. No, he's not, but it's, it's not necessarily like, you know, can he do it? It's just, it's literally like, are you, are, is he at risk of re-injuring it? If he's, you know, being more involved in the slot as a run defender and things like that. That's my only concern is do they keep him outside simply to maybe mitigate some of that? Because it is a little bit more of a physical position. It's not that outside corner isn't, but slot just ends to be in the middle of the field and involved in that a little bit more. So that's my only concern with Jair in the slot. If he's healthy enough to do it and there's no risk of re-injury, no question about it. To me, that's their best possible lineup. I just wonder if they maybe won't put him in that position if his shoulder's not 100% or there is that risk of re-injury. Yeah, I I get that. But at the same time, I think Matt LaFleur has done a good job of saying, if you are if you can play, then you can play. Yeah. And he point. always says, like, <laughs> one of my favorite things about Matt LaFleur is he will say after a game, we had him on a pitch count and then did not stick to the pitch count at all. <laughs> Like Aaron, Aaron Jones last year, when he came off of the injury, they, they said that like, they wanted to get him like 20 plays and he ended up playing like the whole game. They built the offense out of Aaron Jones to beat the 49ers. And Matt LaFleur after was like, yeah, well, we had him on a pitch count, but it was working. So we just kept doing it. And that is born from the philosophy of we're not going to play guys unless they can play, play. Yeah. Like if they can play, then they're going to play. And we're going to wait until you can play to play you. That seems like an intuitive idea, but that is not how it works for for every team. And so I personally would wait until Jay Alexander can just play. Like, just go out there and play. And there's always risk, right? There's always risk of injury. Now, are they are they going to wait? And this was this I talked to a, um, an orthopedic specialist about this. Like, are they going to wait until a grade three tear is a grade one tear? like heals enough that he can just harness it up and go, or are they going to let it heal heal? Because that would be to your point. I think that would be the difference is okay. If he's going to go out there with a, with a, some sort of injury and brace it up and just play and he he's be, be okay. Yeah. Then maybe you don't want to put him in the slot, but if when he's out there, he's good. Put him in the slot. That, I mean, there's a reason Jalen Ramsey is playing the star for the Rams. And it's because that is an extremely valuable role on this team. And when you have guys playing as good as the Packers do, it's, it would be quite the luxury to have someone like, like Jair in there. Plus imagine more opportunities to like slot blitz Jair. Imagine more opportunities for him to fill and run support on a running back. Like he's going to take the handoff from someone on one of these plays if they let him do that. So I don't know, just, just uh, the wheels turning food for thought. So let's quickly run through the corners, obviously getting Eric Stokes in the first round, 
I think Kevin King giving him the $6 million is still one of the more questionable decisions. This team, I still think, you know, as a fourth corner, Kevin King is better than, you know, you don't want Isaac Yadam or some of these guys out there. I still think there's some value there, just not 6 million worth. They bring back Chandon Sullivan on a restricted deal. They get Shamar John Charles in the fifth round trade for Isaac Yadam. Of course, picking up Razul Douglas midseason, somehow getting draft capital for Kadar Hallman in a trade. Josh Jackson, they are able to swing for Isaac Yadam. And then, uh, yeah, those are the those are the main ones at corner. Just a just a small smattering of of important decisions at corner this this past year. Yeah, rest in peace, Josh Jackson. Um, the the dream is dead, unfortunately. Uh the the Kevin King thing is is it beggars belief. It really does. Like you could have had Russell Douglas for nothing. Yeah, you could have had Quentin Dunbar for nothing. In when they did it, when they did the deal, those guys could have been signed for nothing. I, I, I don't really buy the explanation for Matt LaFleur that like we feel differently about him in the building than the, the public perception is outside of the building because the public perception is based on what he is on the field. It is not. And, and, and if he's a great guy, awesome. Um, but so he's, Douglas. right. And he's not a great football player. Like that, that is, that is what he's being judged on. I don't think he is a bad person because he's a bad football player. I don't, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, I'm, I'm a bad football player. I don't think I'm a bad person. So I would be, I would be a really bad boundary corner in, in Joe Barry's defense. I don't think that makes me a bad person. Um, So the, the, that decision I'll never understand. I pretty much like everything. I mean, I did not love Eric Stokes when they, when they drafted him, there were other players I liked better. Um, and, and some of those guys are playing really well. Asante Samuel Jr. is playing really well for the Chargers. Um, but I understood why they did it. And he has, he has exceeded my expectations for this. The Rasul Douglas thing is, is proof positive of what we're talking about, Andy. Like, they could have had Rasul Douglas in March. And maybe, maybe things go differently. I mean, maybe Minnesota, maybe that game goes differently if he's the preferred starter from the jump. Because... They benched Kevin King in that game, and they, they, they didn't say that, but that's what happened. We saw it, and then he got hurt, and he's been hurt. He can't get, he can't get his job back. This is, this is another thing. This is not a Brian Gutekind's problem. This is, a, this is a coaching staff problem. Russell Douglas balled out. Kevin King got healthy, and they let him compete for his job again, despite the fact that, he, that that was crazy, and he played well for two games. Great. That's a credit to him. Then he was bad again. Like, this is who he is. We know that. So Russell Douglas had earned those that, that job already. Just leave him out there. If they had done that, honestly, you could make the case that they beat Minnesota if Russell Douglas starts and finishes that game, despite the fact that he didn't play a great game either. So I'm, I'm getting off my soapbox um, because I, I, my throat is sore talking about Kevin King. We're on the same page. Uh, same with Stokes, same with King, same with Douglas, all of it. Uh, I've said for uh, a while now, you get the same Kevin King season every year. You get four games every year. It's a quarter of everything. You get a quarter of Kevin King every year where you're like, wow, you know, Kevin King can really play like that. That's a good version of Kevin King. You get four games where he's going to miss with injury, at, you know, right around there. You get four completely nondescript games where he doesn't do anything good, doesn't do anything bad. He's just kind of there. And then you get four just god awful Viking game where he's thrown out five times, gives up four catches, you know, and, and just looks terrible. So, um, that's their, that's your Kevin King in a nutshell. And you know what, who's not that Rizul Douglas and he's been way better and I'm with you. They can't go back just to wrap things up super quick. Of course, he also trades for Bojo. The long snapper thing is, I don't even know what to make of that right now. They don't, they can't find a returner, which is also a little bit of an indictment. Obviously moving on from JK Scott was the right move. I don't even know if we need to talk about it, but special teams is still special teams. Um, Kylan Hill was, was, I think going to be a good returner for them. Um, the Amari Rogers thing, I, I kind of don't blame Brian Gutekinds for because Amari Rogers is not a good returner right now. And I don't know why that is because he was a very good returner at Clemson when he was asked to do it. And then they put in Randall Cobb finally, which is, which is the right move. And then he muffs a punt. So I just, I, I it's bad juju. I don't know, but like the Bohorquez deal. Awesome. Um, I don't know what more he was supposed to do. This is, this is a players have to go do the thing now. This is not like Brian Gutekinds has not supplied enough. You, you can say a lot of things about Brian Gutekinds. 
you cannot accuse him of not trying to allocate enough resources to special teams. This is a guy who took a punter and a long snapper with picks, which you do not do. That was, and, and those were bad decisions, but he tried to fix it and it just didn't work. He traded for a punter. Turns out that did work. So he tried. It just, it, the players have to be better. I'm with you. I'm with you. We got to get out of here. What are you working on? What can we, uh, what can we find right now uh, over on the leap? Um, it's a, it's a great week on the leap because we, we don't have to dig into the nitty gritty. We can just look at some big picture stuff. Um, I looked, um, yesterday, when is this coming out? No, today I looked at, um, early down success and why that has been a problem for the Packers. Um, and, uh, it is, it is a weird thing in a year where they have been very good offensively that they have not been very good on early downs. And uh, there are there are some ways that that I think they can fix that. So that's coming. Um, and uh, we're we're on YouTube now, too. We copied you so you can follow yes, I, was, Packers. I was the one who just, uh, who came up with putting uh, putting things on YouTube. Also. Yes, you were the one that came up with video um, Packers content. No. And, and we had uh, Chancellor Johnson on the show today that's awesome. um, for for Locked on Packers. We got a little bit of insight into Chancellor, um, the, the person. Um, he's, he's a really neat guy. Um, and, and he has a lot of insight, not just on, um, the Packers, which, which he was great on, but also on, on being a brand new reporter on being a brand new uh, reporter of color in, 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 on a beat that does not have many of those, I think just one other, um, person on the beat. So, um, really great conversation. I hope everyone, um, will, will check that out. Yeah, that's awesome. Chandler or Chancellor's the best. Um, and yeah, that, that, I'll definitely be checking that out over on Locked On, even though it is the rival podcast. Still love the work that you're doing over there. Appreciate this every other Wednesday. I know it's been a, a hot second since we've been able to do it, but always enjoy chatting with you. Make sure to, where can we follow you on Twitter, Peter? Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Packers. There it is. I will be right back here tomorrow with Packers guard or former guard, Mike Wall. So make sure to check that out and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go!